Are you wanting to create cool renders and animations with Blender, but are unsure how to get started or what you're missing in your Blender skill set? In this free YouTube course, I'll be covering the vital fundamentals to creating cool renders and animations. Whether you're a beginner starting in Blender or an intermediate user looking to patch up your skills in a few areas. Each episode of the course will be completed with free PDF guides, quizzes, memorable analogies and visuals to help you understand what's being taught so you can apply the knowledge to your personal projects after the course is completed. The PDF guides and course videos will also act as a great revision tool if you want to commit the knowledge you learn to long-term memory. During this course, we will be creating two animation projects and we will cover the full workflow step by step, starting with creating abstract 3D shapes, setting up a studio and camera, animation, realistic studio lighting, rendering the animation and then turning our rendered frames into a video so you can share your hard work on your favourite social media. I will also be here to guide you through each lesson by answering any questions you may have in the comments comment section. We will also be using a free built-in Blender add-on, everyone has this add-on by default for clarification, called the Tissue add-on to help us create these cool shapes. The course will be comprised of 9 video lessons starting from tomorrow where we will make this cool abstract 3D shape to animate with in Blender. So make sure to subscribe if you want to be notified when it's released. Each lesson will be released one day after the other, for example you can expect lesson 2 the day after tomorrow. After the course I will also be releasing more tutorials on 3D animations and rendering to keep you your skills sharp and of course other blender tutorials as per usual on the channel. Thank you so much for watching this trailer and I look forward to seeing you for the first lesson tomorrow. Creating abstract shapes like these can seem like a daunting task for beginners and early intermediates, but Blender has some hidden features which allow you to create shapes like these easily. These features I'm talking about is actually a built-in Blender add-on called Tissue. I call it built-in since I don't have to download anything from the internet, as it's already inside Blender, which is really handy. Let's start off by enabling this add-on. I'll first go to Edit, and then I'll left-click Preferences. Once you're in Preferences, you can left-click Add-ons, left-click the search bar, and just search for Tissue. Then you can left click the box here to enable it. And finally, you can left click these three bars, left click save preferences, and you can close this window. Now we have our add-on enabled, you can find it here on our side panel. If you can't see the side panel, you can just press N to open or close it. We're not going to use it just now though, because we're going to go ahead and create our base shape. To do that, I'm going to add a shape called a torus, which looks a bit like a bagel or a donut. You can press Shift A, and then under Mesh, you can left click torus. If I zoom in here, you can see we have this ring shape. I'm just going to leave everything as it is, and I'm going to press Tab to go into Edit Mode. Edit Mode allows us to change the geometry of our object. You can see I can left click individual faces to select them and press G to move them. You can also move the individual points by pressing 1 on the keyboard to select vertices, 2 on the keyboard to select edges and 3 on the keyboard to select faces. You can also rotate these faces by pressing R, make them bigger or smaller by pressing S for scale and if you want to come out of edit mode you just press tab. You can think of tab as a way to toggle between object and edit mode which you can also change up here. Now I want to make my torus a bit thicker so I'm going to press A which will allow us to select all. I like to think of this as A for all. Then you can press Alt and then S, and this will, rather than scale it, it will increase the radius. And now we've got a thicker shape. Now we're gonna create something called a component. This is a term used for tissue, and our torus will act as our base. So you can think of a component as something we'll place on the base. This will make more sense once we put everything together. So I'll press Shift A, and then under Mesh, I'm gonna left click Plane. Then I'll press G and Y to pull this out. I'm then gonna come down to my modifier properties, which is this blue spanner icon. I'll then press Add Modifier, and I'm gonna choose Subdivision surface. You can see it's turned our square into a more rounded shape. I'll increase my levels viewport here which will make our component we're making more smooth. In order to make our corners more hard we can left click this advanced button and where it says boundary smooth we can change it from all to keep corners. Then I'm going to press tab to go into edit mode for this and you can see we've only got one face here. I'm going to press 2 to go into edge select mode, and this allows us to select individual edges. I'll then press ctrl r which will allow us to add a loop cut. A loop cut is just a loop that goes around the object. Once I left click you can see I can move it around but I'm going to right click to keep it in the middle. The way I remember this hotkey is you can think of it as control and then R for rope. So you're controlling a rope around the object or adding a loop. Now I want to create three more loops here so I could either press control R and then add another two loops this way or alternatively I could left click this edge here and press control B to create two more edges like this. You can then scroll your mouse wheel up in order to add an extra loop or you can left click when you're satisfied and open this menu in the bottom left hand corner here to make some adjustments. For example, you can change your segments here 
to 2 and now you can see we have three edges. I also changed my width to 0.5 so everything is perfectly in the center. Now I'm going to left click my edge here and we can hold down shift left click to select multiple things. This works in object mode as well. I'll then press G and Z and pull this up and you can see we've got a nice smooth pattern here. The reason this is smooth is because of the subdivision surface modifier we add. If I was to disable this by pressing this monitor button which disables the modifier in the viewport, the viewport is this workspace here. You can now see we have a very rigid object like how it's seen in edit. I'll put it back on for now. I'm sidetracking here but another thing to know about modifiers which some beginners may value in knowing is you can actually apply them to turn them into actual geometry. Notice how right now our geometry looks like this and now if I left click this and press apply and then go back in, you can see that it's actually become physical geometry. I'll press Ctrl Z to undo that because sometimes it's not desirable to apply modifiers in case you want to make further adjustments later. You can also right click it and press Shade Smooth in order to create a smooth appearance. Now I want to take my component here and place it all over my torus but I'm wanting to do it in this diagonal pattern and you can see that we've just got straight up and down squares and because tissue will add this component on each square it won't be diagonal. So there's two solutions to this. One is to make a diagonal component or you can make the torus itself diagonal. Since it's easier to make the torus diagonal, I'm going to do that. So first I'll left click the torus, making sure I'm in object mode. Then where the blue spanner or wrench is, I'm going to left click add modifier and I can just left click the search bar and search for decimal. I'll then left click to add the modifier. I'm going to change it from collapse to unsubdivide and change the iteration to 1. And straight away you can see that we now have diamond shapes for each of our squares. These squares in 3D are called quads. If you see a triangle face in 3D, you would actually call these tries. And if you have a, a face with more than five edges, you would call that an angle. If I press tab to go into edit mode, you can see we have our original geometry still. So in this case, I'm actually going to apply the modifier. So I'll come to my decimate modifier, left click this button and press apply. Now we're going to try and add this component to our torus. So I'm going to left click the component and then shift left click the base, which is our torus. It's important you do this in the right order. So make sure to select the component first. If you're unsure if you select it in the right order, remember the thing you select last will be highlighted yellow and the thing you selected before will be orange. If I now left click the tissue here in the side menu, remember you can press N to open I can then press test late. I'll leave all these settings as is and just press OK. And now you can see it's placed our component all over our torus. You can see things look a little jagged so I'll press right click and choose shade smooth. But you'll notice how we don't have these orientated in the right way. You'll also notice that if I left click this and press G it's actually created a brand new torus for us. So what I'll do is I'll press G and Y to move this along. G for grab and then Y to move it along this green line which is actually the Y axis as shown here. The first way I can fix this orientation is to do it manually. So I could left click my torus and press tab. Then what I could do, I could go into face select mode by pressing 3 on the keyboard, left click one of the faces and if I press right for example, you can see the face on the tessellated one has now rotated. Flip will rotate at 180 degrees so you'll notice no significant change for our case. Left will move it 90 degrees in the other direction. Thankfully, while this method works well, it's very time consuming, so there's an easy way to go about fixing this. If you remember when we pressed the tessellate button, a bunch of options came up and we can actually edit these options by left clicking our tessellation here and then left clicking our green triangle here. This is called the object data properties menu. We can come down to where it says tissue tessellate and here we've got all of our settings. First we have our fill mode and we're only going to talk about two of them today. Quad will place the component on each face. The reason it's called quad is because it works best with quads and if you remember quad is a face with four edges or four vertices. Whereas a face or a polygon with three edges would be a tri, or a face with five or more edges or vertices would be called an angle. So quad just means this would work best with quad squares. And it will also place the component on each one of these squares. We'll talk about patch a little bit later, but it's essentially something that allows you to place a component on a face before considering the quads that a subdivision surface will add. Meaning we can retain the smoothness, but we can still keep the same amount of quads. This will make more sense when we show it later. Another common setting we use is merge. If I leave this off and press tab to go into edit mode, and I press L to select one of these linked faces and move them, you can see this comes separated. Whereas if I was to enable merge, and then press tab again, and then press L, you can see all these are now connected. And if I was to move a face near the point where they were separated before, you can see it's now all connected. Since these aren't all correctly orientated, it's not going to be able to merge everything properly. Another few settings to keep in mind are these thickness settings. If I change the scale here, we can increase the intensity of the component on the tessellation. I'll press Ctrl Z to undo this. Finally, under rotation, there are a few options. And here where it says default, we're going to be changing this to active UV later to get the automatic orientation we want. But for now, I'm just going to leave it on default. This shift value is also very handy when you're using the UV. With that explained, let's go on to making a UV. I'll left click my base here since we're going to need to edit it. 
I'll press tab to go into edit mode and I'm also going to want to bring out a second workspace called the UV editor just so I can better explain how this works. To do this I'll come up to the top left hand corner until a cross shape appears and then I'll left click and drag to pull this out. You can see this pulls out a second 3D viewport. I can then change from 3D viewport here to UV editor and this will allow us to edit our UV and view it. Right now if I press A to select everything this is our default Taurus UV which as you can see is quite messy. A UV is typically something important for texturing. It can also be used with a tissue add-on to orient things properly as seen under the tissue tessellate rotation settings from before. We want to create some strips with our UV in order to tell Blender to orient everything in straight lines which will create that rotation we're looking for. To do this I'm going to want to select a bunch of edges going in the same direction. I'll press 2 to go into edge select mode in edit mode and press alt left click which will allow us to select a loop. Then I can press shift alt left click to select a second loop and I'm just going to keep doing this until I've selected all the loops I need. Once you have selected all your loops with shift alt left click it should look something like this. And now we just need to mark these as seams in order to unwrap it. Seams are like cuts and UV unwrapping is like cutting your 3D object to turn it into a 2D form. So I'll now right click and then choose mark seam. Then you can press A for all, U and then unwrap. And now you can see that the edges we've marked have allowed us to create these looping bands around our object and you can see it's represented here in the UV. But rather than looping bands we need straight lines so Blender understands better what we're trying to do with tissue. So to do that I'm going to go to the top view and I'm going to want to turn these loops into straight lines. So to do that I need to cut the loop in half. So I'm just going to left click these edges and shift left click them to select multiple. Now I have them all selected it should look something like this and now all we need to do is right click again and choose mark seam. Remember if you're not in edge select mode which is this button here or two on the keyboard you won't get the option to mark seam when you right click. Now I can press A, U and then unwrap again and now you can see we've got these straight strips rather than loops. This will be enough in order for tissue to understand how I want to orientate my faces. Now if I left click my tessellation, come down to rotation and I change it from default to active UV, you can see everything is orientated correctly. If you have any issues with this, I recommend left clicking your component, shift left clicking your torus again, which is your base, and then tessellating again. You can see that it disabled my shade smooth as well. If you want to stop this from happening, you can enable this smooth shading and it will do it every time you refresh it. But we still have a bit of a problem. It's looking a little bit jagged. Also, if you come down to to active UV and you press this shift button I can now rotate it in the other direction giving me even more flexibility. But we still have a bit of a problem and that's that this is still looking a bit jagged. This is where the power of patch comes in. If I come back to my torus here come to my modifiers here, press the add modifier, search, and then choose subdivision surface. Now we have a smoother base to work with. I'll maybe change this to an intensity of two, and I'm going to delete my tessellation since we don't need it now. I'll then left click my component, shift left click my torus, open my side menu with N, and then where it says tissue, I'll left click tessellate. If I leave it on quad and press OK, you can see we have loads of really small components, which is not what we're going for. I'll go to my green triangle, which will allow me to edit my settings, and I'll press G and Y to move it along. The first problem is is things aren't orientated correctly again and that's because by default our rotation is on default. So I'm going to change it from default to active UV again. Now you can see everything is orientated the right way. I'll also turn on my smooth shading and I'll turn on merge. Another problem we have is that our components are too small and this is because it is using the subdivided torus here but we want to use the original squares that still have the smoothness of the subdivision surface. That's where the power of patch comes in. So I'll come up to fill mode and change it from quad to patch. And now you can see we have our swirl shape that we were going for. Great, well done for creating your own swirl. And that's today's lesson over. In the next lesson, we're going to be setting up the scene so we're ready to start animating. Also, if you have any questions about today's lesson, feel free to let me know in the comment section below. Now though, we're going to have a quick quiz to cover what we learned today. Number one, what is the difference between the quad fill mode and the patch fill mode? Number two, in our project, what was the component and what was the base? Number three, which menu did we edit our tessellation settings in? Feel free to pause the video and then play when you're ready to answer the questions. Number one, what is the difference between quad and patch? Quad will place the component on each square of the base, whereas patch will do the same thing, but it will take the subdivision's smoothness into account without its extra faces. Number two, what was our component and base in our project? If you remember, the component is placed on the base, so the component would be our object here, whereas the base would be our torus. Number three, where do we find the tissue tessellate settings? This can be found in the green triangle called the object data properties menu under a tab called tissue tessellate. You will find this on the tessellation rather than the base. Studio setups are commonplace in Blender projects such as product visualization and of course renders and animation. Today we will get our scene set up ready for animation in the next lesson. First of all I'm going to hide some of the objects I don't need here. So I'm just going to left click my torus here and 
Up here in the top right hand corner, you can see there's an eye and a camera button. The eye button will remove it in the 3D viewport and the camera button will remove it in render. So it's important to press both of these. If you can't see these buttons, left click this filter button here and you can see you can enable it here. I'll also do the same for my component. Next up, I'm going to press Shift A and then under Mesh, I'm going to left click Plane. Then I'm going to zoom into my plane here, press tab to go into edit mode and 2 to go into edge select mode. Then I'll left click this edge here and I'm going to press E and Z and just pull this up. Now if we want to make this a bit more smooth, we can left click our edge here and press Control B and this will create a smooth transition between the two. We can left click it and then you can also open this menu here to increase the segments. You can also use your mouse wheel to do this. Once I've done that, I'll right click and choose Shade Auto Smooth. I'm going to press S and that will enable the scale mode. I'm going to make it a bit bigger so it's a bit more appropriate compared to the size of my tessellation. I'll maybe move it to around there. I'll then left click my swirl shape here and press G and Y, G for grab and Y to move it along the Y axis. The Y axis is this green line here as indicated by the symbol up here. I'll then press shift D and this is going to duplicate my swirl. The reason I'm doing this is because in my animation I have two of these. I'll then press R which will enable rotation mode and now if I move my mouse you can see it rotates along with it. But what I'm going to do is press R Y which will then rotate it on only the Y axis and then you can type in a number to move it a certain degrees. If we type in the number 90 that will move it 90 degrees like this. Then I can press G and Y to move it along. You can then shift left click these two and move them more towards the middle. I'm also going to left click my studio background here and press G and Z to pull it down a little bit. And now I have my two objects floating in front of our studio. Next up, we're going to add the camera. So I'm going to press Shift A and in the add menu, there's an option called camera. You may have a camera in your scene by default, in which case you can just use that camera. I'll select my camera by left clicking it here in the outlier or in the 3D viewport if you can find it and press G and X to pull it along this X axis. So I'm grabbing it with G and then moving it along the X axis with X. If you want to see what your camera is looking at and what your render will look like, you can left click this film camera button here. You can also press numpad 0 if you have a numpad. Now we're in the camera view, we want to figure out how to get the camera to move when we move in Blender, as this will be much quicker than moving it manually. So I'll press N to open the side menu, and I'm going to come up to view. Under view lock, this may be closed view, I'll left click to open it, and I'm going to choose this lock camera to view option. Now when I move the hand symbol, you can see my camera moves with it. You can also use your middle mouse button to navigate, or if you're on laptop, you can also use this gizmo here in order to move your viewport. I'm going to keep moving my camera into position until I get something I'm happy with. You can also left click your camera and press R and Y for example, rotate it up and down and you can do that for all the axes. For example, R and Z to move it left and right and R and X move it this way. Although I don't want to go for this kind of dynamic angle. I'll maybe move it up a little bit with the hand icon and press R and Y to rotate it down a tiny bit. I can also press G and Z to grab it and pull it up. This should do for now because we're going to create an empty in the next episode in order to control our camera much easier. If you want to come out of this camera mode, you can left click this film camera and you can see it is in position. Now we need to make everything a bit more of an appropriate scale. When we add the lighting, it will be a little bit easier to understand and follow along. And also, if you want to use depth of field in your render or animation, it is important everything is at the correct scale. In order to see what scale things are at, we need to left click this item tab in the side menu. You can then left click this transform panel to see everything here. If I left click my 3D swirl here, you can see there's this thing called dimensions. This tells me what the real world scale of this object is. And right now you can see it's almost 3 meters tall. I'm going to press A to select everything and then I'm going to shift left click one of the swirls last. The reason I do that, we can see the dimensions of the last selected object as I'm going to use that as my reference point. Then I'll press S to scale everything down. It's also important to remember that this button here isn't on individual origins and rather is set to medium point. I'll scale everything equally rather than individually. I'll then press S and I'm going to scale it down until our X and Y are around 0.7 which is around 70 centimeters. About there should do nicely. Now if I want to go back, I can just zoom in. Now I'm going to press the film camera button to go back into my camera view. And if I left click my camera in the outliner here, you can see we have a bunch of settings. The first thing is focal length. This is a real world camera feature and in different types of photography, you tend to use a different focal length. For example, if I was doing a character render, I would probably use a focal length around 100. But for this project, I'm going to keep it at a focal length at 50. Anything lower than this may look a little skewed, so do be careful when using this focal length parameter. Here's what it looks like when you adjust this value. In film and animation, performing a zoom is done by changing the focal length. I'm going to change this back to 50. Under viewport display, we're going to have a bunch more settings here. This pass part out, if I turn this up to 1, 
We'll make it so we can only see what is on our camera. This can be handy to make things clear. I've also got these composition guides here, which will allow me to better compose my image. For example, if you're aware of the rule of thirds and you want to use it for your render or animation, you can turn on this to see the points on the image where there's a third. There's also a center option, which will allow us to make things nice in the middle. And you even have settings for a golden ratio if you want to use that. Then we also have depth of field, which will allow us to make some things in focus and other things not so much. We're not going to be using this in this project, so we're not going to focus on this for this course. If you're wanting to learn how to add the lighting to the studio, you can check out the video in the top right hand corner now. Keep in mind, if you're watching this video while it airs, this video will be out in two days time. For everyone else though, we're going to be moving on to animation in the next episode before we cover lighting. But first, we're going to have a quick quiz. Number one, how did we create the studio background? Number two, how did we move our camera more easily? Number three, why did we scale everything to a more realistic scale? Feel free to pause the video and take time to answer the questions. And then when you're ready, you can just press play and listen to my answers. Number one, how did we create the studio background? To do this, we just create the plane, then we pressed E for extrude on the edge at the end in order to pull up another face. Then, in order to make the transition smooth, we first beveled it by pressing Ctrl B, which creates that smooth transition on an edge. And then we went into object mode and pressed right click, shade smooth. This allowed us to get rid of the jaggedness on the bevel. Number two, how did we move our camera more easily? To do this, we left click this film camera button. And then once we were in camera view, we pressed N to open the side menu, went up to the view panel, and under view lock, we turned on camera to view. This meant when we moved the hand icon, or the zoom icon, or done any other type of movement in the 3D viewport, the camera would move with us. Number 3. Why did we scale everything to a more realistic scale? This is more of a general guideline in order to allow us to have better depth of field as well as making things easier to work with in projects in general. It will also help you follow along with this course more easier once I get into lighting in two episodes time. If you're unsure if you answered the questions correctly or not, feel free to type your answers in the comment section below and I'll answer them for you. Also, if you have any other questions about today's video, please feel free to ask. Apart from that though, tomorrow we're going to be moving on to animation. Today, we'll be covering the basics of animating in Blender by creating this abstract animation. Make sure to catch up on the last tutorials in the course if you want to follow along. The link is in the description if you're interested, or in the top right hand corner. To start off, I'm going to animate my swirls. So first, I'm going to pull up this timeline here by left clicking the top and just pulling up. And I'm going to move this thing called the playhead to frame 1. You can see if I left click in here, I can move it to a different frame. I can also control it with this button here. I can just type in the number I want to move it to, for example 1. And now the, the blue playhead is at frame 1. This is important because when we add a keyframe, we want to make sure we add it to the right frame, and that will be determined by the playhead. I'll left click this swirl, and I'm going to press I, and this will bring up an insert keyframe menu. A keyframe is pretty much saving the information of animation in a certain point on the timeline. I'm going to choose rotation, since I'm only going to be rotating this object. But if I wanted to move it, I would choose location or location and rotation if I wanted to move it and rotate it. Now I've done that, you can see a yellow diamond shape has appeared at frame 1 on our timeline. This is to show that the rotation of this object has been saved at frame 1. Then I wanted to move 180 degrees by frame 250. So I'm going to left click 250 and then I'm going to press R, Z and then type in 180 to move it 180 degrees. R stands for rotation and Z means rotating it across the up and down axis or the Z axis which is that blue line you see here. Once I've rotated it you need to make sure you don't change frame on the timeline otherwise it will reset it. Even though I've just done that you can see nothing's changed and that's because this object is symmetrical. So I'm going to go back to 250 and press RZ and then 180 again to 180 degrees. Then I'll press I and then rotation in order to save the rotation at this point. Now if I press the spacebar to play you can see our object is now rotating. Now I'm going to repeat the process for the second swirl. So I'll left click it, press I and then choose rotation. Then I'll come to frame 250 and press R and this time I'm going to choose X because I want to rotate it around this red line which is the X axis. I'm going to choose RX and I'm going to choose 180. Then I'll press I and then I'll choose rotation. And now you can see we've encountered a bit of an issue. Our second swirl isn't rotating as we'd expect. And this is to do with issues with local and global axis. To fix this, I'm going to want to first come to my timeline and press A to select all. Just like with objects, you can select keyframes by left clicking and you can also even move them by pressing G. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to come to frame 1 and then I'm going to come to my keyframes and press A and then X to delete. So it's A for all and then X to delete. It's also really important that you do this at frame 1 because if I was to delete the keyframes at a different frame, it will be slightly rotated still. So now I've done that, I'm going to do something called applying the rotation. So to do that, I'll press Ctrl A and then choose rotation. What that's done is it's made this 3D swirls rotation, the default rotation for the object, meaning you won't have any issues with the local axis. You can also fix this rotation issue using empties and object constraints. I'm then going to add my keyframes again. 
So I'll press I, and then I'm going to choose rotation. Then I'm going to come to frame 250, press R, X, and then 180 to rotate it 180 degrees. Then press I, and then rotation again. And now when I press play, you can see the rotation is working as expected. If you wanted the swirl to rotate in the other direction, you could go ahead and left click this keyframe, press X to delete it. You'll see now that the rotation is no longer rotated 180 degrees because I deleted that keyframe. And it will now use the rotation of the last marked keyframe, which was zero. What I can do is I can press R, X, and then choose minus one. 180, which will move it 180 degrees in the other direction and then choose I and then rotation. And now you can see it's rotating in the other direction. So you can pick which one you prefer. Next up, we're going to want to rotate both of these swirls at the same time. But if we do this annually, we'll probably encounter that strange rotation issue again. So in order to prevent that, we're going to use the empty and object constraint I touched on earlier. So I'll zoom out a little bit and then I'm going to press shift A and then under empty, I'm going to choose plane axes. If I press G and X to pull this along this red line here, and I might press S to scale it down. This will be a controller for our swirl designs. So I'll press G and Z and maybe move it down a little bit. So I'll press G and Z and maybe I'll move it out to the left by pressing G and then Y. Now if I rotate this empty by pressing R and Y, because I want to rotate it along this axis, you can see the swirls aren't moving. And that's because we need to actually assign our swirls to our empty. We can do this by parenting it, but I like to use the constraints in order to introduce them to you. So first I'm going to left click my 3D swirl here, and I'm going to come to this menu here, which looks like two wheels on a caterpillar track. And under add object constraint, I'm going to choose child of. This will pretty much make it so this swirl will be attached to the target. And I'm going to make the target this empty. Now if I left click my empty again and press R, you can see the swirl now moves with it. This will make it easier to animate both of these at the same time. And then I'm going to do the same process for the other one. So I'm going to left click the other swirl, then come to this menu here in the constraints menu, add object constraint, and you can just choose child of. Select your target as the empty again, and you're all good to go. I'm going to left click my empty and come to frame one. I'm first going to press I again and choose rotation since we're only keyframing rotation. Then you can come to frame 250, press R, Y, and then 90 to move it 90 degrees. But you can see we have an issue and that's that our objects aren't moving perfectly in the middle. For now, I'll just press I and then rotation to save that rotation. And you can see how this rotation might not be how I've desired it. One simple fix is to make this empty more centered. So I'll come to the side here and I'm going to try and better align it to the center. So first I'll left click my swirls and I'm just going to press this I button to disable the child of constraints and I'm do this for the other one too. Then I'm going to left click my empty again and I'm going to press G and X and I'll just move it to the center. Then I'll need to reset these child of constraints. So I'm just going to press X to remove them. And then I'm going to add them again by pressing child of and I'm going to choose the empty again and do the same for the other constraint. Now when I play the animation, you can see it rotates perfectly in the center, just as we'd hoped. Now we're going to add an empty for the camera too, because I want to rotate the camera a little bit. I'll press shift A and I'm going to create a brand new empty. I'm just going to choose plain axes again. I'll zoom out so I can see it, press G and X to move it out. And to avoid the issue we had last time and also to make the animation look a little nicer. I'm going to make sure it is in the center, which currently it is, but I just want to make sure it's on the center of the Y axis too. So I've just moved it back a little bit. I've done that using G and X. Then I'll press S to scale it down and I'll press G and Z to maybe pull it to around here. If you find it a little bit too hard to see, you can press G and Z to just pull it underneath. Now I'm going to left click my camera and in the constraints tab, I'm going to choose a child of constraint for the camera too. And I'll make the target this empty here. In order for organization, I'm actually going to go ahead and name some things here. So our camera is named appropriately, but we're also going to want to name this empty here. So I'll rename it by double clicking it and then calling it swirl controller. For the other empty, I'm going to double click and rename it to camera controller. As for this big plane here, I'm going to double click this and I'm going to rename it to studio background. I'll also name my tessellation to swirl1 and swirl2. If you want to be extra organized, we can also name our old base and component objects to just torus to base and plane to component. There. Now our scene is a little bit more organized. I'll left click my empty and if I press R and Z, you can see I can now rotate my camera easily on the Z axis. So I'm going to come to frame one and I'm going to go into camera view by pressing the film camera so I can see what I'm doing here. I'll maybe press R and Z and I'll rotate it a little bit to the left here. You're going to want to make sure the studio isn't completely out of the scene, but we can also scale it up later. I'll maybe press R, Z and then minus 10 so I can rotate it 10 degrees to the left. I'll then press I and then I'm going to choose rotation. Then I'm going to come to frame 250 here and I'm going to press R, Z and then 20 just to rotate it 20 degrees in the other direction. I'll then press enter, then I and then choose rotation. Now about the studio, it's a little bit too small in order to fit our animation. So I can just press S 
to scale it. Or if you don't want to change where the bend bit is, you can just press S and Y, so only scale on the Y axis, making it bigger in that direction only. Now you can see we've got no issues when we play the animation. Also, if you want to make sure you're playing your animation at the right frame rate, I'll come to my output properties, and I'm going to change my frame rate to 30 frames per second, because I believe that looks a little bit smoother. You can also see here, I've got my resolution X and Y, and this will allow me to change the dimensions of the camera. For example, if I wanted to make it look like it was shot on a phone, I could change it to 1080 by 1920 instead. But I'm going to reset that to the default. Also, if you want to move your camera closer, you can just left click the camera and you can press G and then Z twice. What this will do is move it on its local Z axis and that's a great way to move it forward and backward and that won't affect the rotation at all since we didn't keyframe the camera itself with any location. Do keep in mind that sometimes Blender struggles to play the animation at the correct frame rate so the animation may appear slower than it will in the final render so do keep that in mind. One important thing to remember is because this is a 30 frames per second animation for every 30 frames here in the timeline one second will pass. One thing you may notice though is in all of our objects the rotation starts slowly and then gets slower near the end but in the middle it's at its fastest. But if you want to make sure it's is moving at the same speed the whole time, we'll need to change the interpolation mode. I'm going to keep the empties at default, which is Bezier, but for these swirls, I'm going to want to change them to linear, which will make it so it's moving at a constant speed the entire time. To do that, I'm just going to left click one of my swirls, and then in this menu, I'll press A to select all my keyframes, right click, and here you've got interpolation mode. Bezier is the default, so I'm going to change it to linear. Now if I play my animation, you can see this swirl here is moving at a constant rate, whereas this one is slightly slow and then speeding up and then slowing down at the end again. So I'll need to do the same thing for the second one too. Since I've got it left click, I'm going to pause my animation, come to my timeline, press A to select everything, right click, and under interpolation mode, I'll change it to linear. And now everything should be working nicely. You can, of course, left click the empty and make these linear too, but I like to keep them on Bezier for now. If you want to get a better visual idea of what's happening here, I'm going to change from timeline to graph editor. No need to follow along with this because there's nothing else you need to do for this tutorial. If I zoom out here, you can see that this linear keyframe has a straight diagonal line showing that it's moving at a constant pace. Whereas our empty, which is still using a Bezier interpolation, down here you can see how it's more curved at the bottom, which is why it can slow down near the end and also start slow at the beginning. You can even edit this as well to get different results with the animation, but this is a little bit advanced for this tutorial. We're going to change back to timeline. Great job for following along and creating this animation. Now we're going to go over a quick quiz to revise what we've learned today. Number one, what key did we press to add the keyframe? Number two, what object constraint did we use to control our 3D swirls and camera with empties? Number three, what is the difference between linear and Bezier interpolation? Feel free to pause the video and take your time to answer the questions. Then when you're ready, you can press play and listen to the answers. Number one, how did we add a keyframe? To add a keyframe, we first selected the object, then we pressed I to open the keyframe menu, then we chose the type of transform we wanted to make. For example, if I wanted to animate how big or small the object was, I would choose scale, but we done rotation, so that's why we would left click rotation, and that would mark our keyframe at the point in the timeline. For us, we wanted to do this at frame one, so we went to frame one, pressed I, and then chose rotation. We then had to go to the end frame, and then add a second keyframe with a different rotation, in order for Blender to know what change to make on the timeline as it's playing. Number two, what object constraint did we use to control our 3D swirls and camera with empties? For this, we used the child of constraint, which is found in the object constraints menu when you have the object selected. We added this to the swirl and then we made the target be empty, which we will use as the parent, if you like, to control this object. We've done the same for the camera and then once we'd had our constraints set up, we could move and animate the empties in order to control our camera and our swirls. Number three, what's the difference between linear and Bezier interpolation? Linear interpolation will make it so it's moving at a constant speed, whereas Bezier, the default type of interpolation, will make it so it starts off slow, speeds up, and then slows down near the end of the, the next keyframe. Great job in completing the quiz. Feel free to let me know your answers in the comment below if you're unsure if you got them right or not. You can also let me know of any questions you may have. Don't forget as well, there's also a free PDF guide accompanied with this tutorial as well as with every other tutorial in this course. In the next lesson, we're going to be going over the lighting for our scene. Now we've created our studio and animation, we need to add some realistic lighting. To start off, we're going to need to add some point lights. I'm going to zoom out of my scene, and I'm going to press Shift A, and then under Light, I'm going to choose Point. If you don't have the studio set up, you can follow along with episode 2 of this course in order to make one. For now though, I'm going to press G and X 
to move this point line out. Now I've got it roughly in the center. I'm going to press G and Y to move it left and right. And I'll just move it along to the left. I'll make it a good distance. That way, because of fall off, there'll be less difference in the light compared to if it was really close. This will make for a nice, flatter, consistent lighting. And then I'm going to left click this green light bulb, which is the same as the green triangle for objects. And this allows us to tweak some settings for our light. In order to actually see what our lights are doing, we need to left click the camera and I'm going to press this viewport shading mode. You can see for now, we've only got a tiny bit of light from that point light we've added, so we'll need to make it a lot brighter. I also want to come down to my world properties here, and if you have one of the default world setups, it will probably look something like this. To remove this default world setting, I'm going to left click this X here. Then I'm going to make sure I've got my point light selected here, and I'm going to come back to my green light bulb settings. I'm going to change it to a higher power, maybe to something like 4500. Now you can see our scene is much brighter, and we've already got some pretty nice lighting here. Next up, we have this parameter called radius, and this controls the actual size of the light. Right now, zero is pretty impossible because that would be an absolutely tiny light. I'm going to want to make this quite a big light, so I'm going to change it to a value of 1.75, which is quite a big light. You can see that makes a small change to the lighting. Then I'm going to go back into the solid mode here in order to add another light a little bit quicker. This is great for people who have lower quality computers as well. But the main reason I'm doing it is one, because my computer isn't the strongest, but also because it struggles with recording software and rendering at the same time. So I'm going to press Shift A and I'm going to choose another point light. Then I'll press G and X to move it out and G and Y to move it to the right. So I'll maybe move it around the same distance as I've done the other one. In fact, I might even move the other one by left clicking it and pressing G and Y to grab it across the Y axis. I'll also press G and Z to pull it up. I'm then going to select my other light and I'm maybe going to give it a power of about 200 because I just want this to be a smaller light to make the shadows a little bit more bright. I'll also give it a, a bigger radius to maybe something like 25 centimeters, which is just 0.25. Another thing to remember about the light source is the light will emanate from this point. So you can think if I pull it up, the light will be coming more from down here now. To preview what my lighting looks like, I'm going to left click my camera again and go into the render viewport shading. Now you can see we've got a pretty nice lighting to start with. We'll cover this again in the next lesson, but there's also an extra feature we can use to enhance our lighting without having to constantly adjust the brightness. To do this, I'll go to my render settings here. The symbol for this looks like the back of a camera. I'm in cycles because that is my preferred render engine. But if you want quicker renders, you can go with Eevee. Just keep in mind Eevee is a much lower quality, but it is faster than cycles. Then under color management, you can see we have some extra settings and I can just change this look to maybe something like high contrast. Now you can see our image has a much higher contrast. So I might keep this at just medium high contrast. I found through experimentation that medium contrast is pretty much the same as keeping it at none. You can also decrease the contrast if you like, but this might make the image look flatter. In composition, typically contrast is a good way to bring your eyes to the subject of the image. Notice how it looks a lot flatter when I set this to very low contrast. I'll set it back to medium contrast. There's also an exposure slider, which will allow you to increase the brightness. This looks horrible though, so I'm going to press Ctrl Z to undo this. Great, now we've finished our lighting, let's have a quick quiz. Number one, where can we edit our lights, brightness and size? To do this, we can left click our point light, and then we can come to this green light bulb setting. Here we can change the power, which will increase the brightness, and the radius will increase the size. This won't affect the brightness at all, but rather it will affect other physics of lights affected by the size of the light itself, such as the shadows and things like that. Number two, what did we turn off which is on by default? This was the world lighting. I went to the world properties setting and made sure to remove any lighting that was here. It should have this plus new symbol if you've removed it correctly. Another alternative way to do this, which I didn't cover, is you could keep the world lighting on and just turn the strength to zero to temporarily turn it off if you wanted to turn it on later. I'll press X to remove this again. Number three, why did I move my light a fair distance from the object? Because of light physics, when the light is closer to the object, it'll make it so there's a lot of light in this area, and then also a lot darker light in this area. This is to do with lighting fall off. However, if I keep my light further away, because the light will be brightest here and darkest here, it'll also get progressively darker, but it'll be much less noticeable than in the beginning, making it a fairly level lighting. Great job on completing the quiz. If you're unsure if you got any of the questions correct, feel free to comment your answers in the comment section below. I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Also, if you have any questions about this lesson in general, feel free to type your questions in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Also, don't forget that this lesson, along with all the other tutorials in this course, is completed with a free PDF guide, which you can use to revise or to check any details from this lesson. Feel free to check that out in the description below. Our scene may have some nice lighting, but it's lacking in some dimension with the swirls. To fix this, I can add some simple metallic materials, which I'll show you how to make in this lesson. If you haven't caught up with this course, you can check out the previous videos in the description below, or you can just follow along with your own project. I'm first going to change to this viewport shading here. This one is different from the final render view, 
So it can be helpful to change between this one here and this one here. This one here is showing you how it will look like in the final version. And this one just giving you a preview, which is a little bit faster on the computer. I'm first going to give my studio background a new material. So I'll left click it and I'm going to left click this red and black checkered ball here to go into material properties. I'll also change my timeline here from timeline to shader editor. These two menus here are actually connected and they're just different ways of representing the same menu. If I press plus new in here for example, you can see a material appears here as well. I'm going to give this a name and just call it studio background. Also, if you ever want to delete a material but save it for later, make sure to press the shield button. If you're concerned, it's always safe just to press this, this button as it will make it so it's never deleted when you close Blender. But as long as it's assigned to an object, you shouldn't have to worry about that. I'm going to change the roughness of my studio to 0.7. Roughness controls the reflectivity of an object's surface. If you want to learn more about shaders, I've got a full course on texturing and shaders. This one is free as well and is also accompanied with free PDF guides just like this course and quizzes. Feel free to check that out in the top right hand corner and description below if you're interested. I'll press enter to make that roughness change. You can also change the colour of your background if you like, but I found that a plain white background worked well for this animation. I'm first going to add my silver material. So I'll left click my swirl on the left here and I'm going to press plus new in one of these menus. Some of you keen eyed viewers may have noticed that when you change one of the values in this principal BSDF, it also changes it here. This here just shows the surface input and you can see this BSDF is plugged into the surface which is why. The most important setting for metal materials is to turn the metallic value to 1. You should only keep this value at either 0 for non-metals and 1 for metals. Roughness again will control the reflectivity. For example, if I was to turn this down to 0, you can see it's going to look pretty much like a mirror. And if I turn this up to 1, it's almost so rough that it pretty much looks like a non-metal. I'm going to keep it at roughness at 0.5 because we're going to use surface imperfections using colours in order to create some nice reflections. But just keep in mind this is a great slider to create some easy reflections. There's a few other settings here which we're just going to leave alone. The only one I'm going to change is this IOR value which stands for index of refraction. Every material or object has an index of refraction and Silver's one is 0.18. I've actually got a free index of refraction PDF guide for different materials in the description below if you want a guide which will show you the IOR for different materials. This is not a complete list but will certainly help you with a lot of common materials so feel free to check that out if you're interested. Changing the IOR isn't necessary but it definitely adds an extra level of realism. Now we've finished the base of our silver I'm going to left click my other swirl here to add a bronze material. I'll press plus new. I'm going to call the material bronze. That reminds me that I actually didn't name the other material so I'm going to left click my swirl again and call this one silver. I'll then left click back to my bronze one. First of all bronze is a metal so if you can remember metals should have a metallic value of one. This will create a plain metal again. I'll maybe turn the roughness down a little bit but again we'll add surface imperfections later so this doesn't really matter. Then I'm going to set a base color of something a little bit more orange. You can see if I make it more yellow we get a kind of gold color but I found the contrast of orange and silver to be a lot nicer. That's why I went for a bronze material. This is an artistic choice of course though so it's completely up to you. If you want to get the same exact color as me you can left click this hex button here by when you left click on the base color and you can type in the same number as me and that will give you the exact same color I'm using. Now for the IOR you can think of it as, as the same as silver but it has a 1 instead of a 0 at the start so that means that the IOR of bronze is 1.18. Don't feel like you have to memorize IOR though rather I just use a guide I made instead or I research it online. Now we can go ahead and add some surface imperfections. I'll start off with my silver here. I'm first going to need to add a few different nodes and I'll explain what they do as we go. First we're going to want to add a texture so I'm going to add a musgrave texture. If I plug my height into the surface here it'll display what this texture looks like. You can see this texture creates a bunch of random splotches which will make for a nice fingerprint-ish effect. This is important because all objects in the real world won't have a perfect shiny surface. Rather they'll have fingerprints and things like that on it and this can be a good way to represent that. Of course you can also use textures downloaded from online as well. Now I'm going to press shift A and under input I'm going to get my texture coordinate. You can see right now that there's a, a few cutoff points on this texture here and that's because it's using the UV by default. But we want to use the object which pretty much places the texture across the object evenly. Now you can see that looks a bit better. Of course if you want it to be smaller again you can just change the scale. Keep in mind though if you press Control A and apply the scale it will reset. So your two options are to always apply the scale which is recommended or you can just press Control Z to undo that and you can just keep it at the scale it's at. But even if that happens you can always just adjust the scale here so it's not really the end of the world. I'm going to change the scale to something like 3. That looks a bit better. Now an important thing to remember is this texture is black and white and black and white values can represent present these grey sockets here. Of course the same would be for the yellow sockets but with colour. Essentially though a thing to remember is when using a texture in order to fuel a certain parameter on the shader, these green nodes are called shaders, black will represent number 0 and white will represent the number 1 and grey values will represent any number in between. So right now as you might have guessed 
The black areas will give the roughness a value of 0, which will be very reflective, and the brighter, whiter areas will create a more rough effect. If I plug my height into the roughness, and then BSDF into the surface, you can see this. Notice how those areas that were once black are more reflective, and there's rougher areas, or less reflective areas, in the white areas. But this is a little bit too high contrast, so I'm going to press Shift A, then under Converter, I'm going to choose Color Ramp. I'll then plug that in between here. You'll notice if I bring the black slider closer to the white slider, it will increase the contrast and sometimes even phase out the other color. But I want to keep it at the default and just make the contrast less. To do that, I would want to make the black one a little bit brighter and the white one a little bit darker. So I'll left click the black one and I'll maybe give it a roughness of this kind of dark grey. This will make it so it's still reflective, but it's not super reflective. Then I'll left click the white notch and I'm going to change the color to make this a bit darker as well, maybe to something around here. Now you can see this is a little bit less contrasty. If you want to keep extra organized, you can left click and drag to box like these nodes, press Ctrl J to join and that will add them to a box and you can move this box around easy. Also, just like in the 3D viewport, you can press N to open the side menu in here and under node there's a label option and you can give this a name. For example, I might call this roughness. Awesome. Then I might left click and drag to box select all these, press Control C and then I'm going to come to my bronze, Control V to paste in here. And now you can see we have a roughness in our bronze now as well. I'll plug my colour back into the roughness and now we have some roughness on our bronze too. You can even make some variation if you like by just changing these values. Maybe I would make this a little bit brighter and this one a little bit darker. But this is completely up to you. If you want a more complex bronze material, I recently made a tutorial on this realistic bronze material so you can feel free to follow that along and apply it to this object here if you like. That's what I used for my final render for showcasing the project in this course. If you want to preview how this will look like in the final render, you can just click this button here. Now you can see roughly what our final render will look like. Of course, you can also make some adjustments by moving the lights or tweaking the brightness, the contrast, and of course, tweaking the materials themselves. Well done on completing today's lesson. Now we're gonna have a quick quiz to recap what we learned today. Number one, what value should be only zero or one on materials? Number two, what setting did we change to add extra realism? Number three, what texture coordinate option did I use to distribute the texture on the object even? Feel free to pause the video and take time to answer the questions. Then you can feel free to press play again and I'll answer the questions for you. Number one, what value should only be zero or one on materials? This was the metallic value. This is because there's no such thing as a half metallic material. So you'd only keep it at zero for non-metals and one for metals. Today we made two metal materials. So both the silver and the bronze were set to one. Of course though, because our studio background is non-metal, we kept the metallic value at zero. Number two, what setting did we change that extra realism? This was the IOR or index of refraction parameter. This is a great way to add a little bit of extra realism but it's more like a little bit of seasoning for your food. Number three, what texture coordinate option did I use to distribute the texture on the object evenly? This was the object mode and this allowed us to distribute our Musgrave texture, which is one of Blender's built-in mathematical textures, across our object evenly. Keep in mind that the object may not work as expected with image textures taken from your computer. Rather, it works best with Blender's built-in textures, such as the Musgrave texture. You may find issues when using it with the brick texture, as this acts a little bit similarly to a regular image texture. Great job in completing the quiz. Feel free to let me know what your answers were if you're not sure if you got them right or not. I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Also, if you have any other questions from today's lesson, feel free to let me know in the comment section below. And as always with all the lessons in this course, there's a free PDF guide accompanied with it, which you can check out in the description below, which can be a great way to revise what you've learned or to help you in future projects. In the next lesson, we're going to be learning about rendering the animation in cycles, where we'll be covering different render settings and where to save our frames on the computer. Now we have our animation, we're going to want to turn it into frames and then video on our computer. First though, we need to set up some important render and output settings. Also, if you're not caught up with the course, make sure to follow the videos if you want to follow along. Otherwise, you can just follow along with your own project. I'm going to start off by coming to my render output set. This looks like the back of a camera, and this is where we can actually tell Blender certain factors such as the quality to render at, and of course the speed as well. At the top here, you can choose your render engine. Eevee will be much faster, but it will also be a much lower quality. Notice how with metals here, Eevee really struggles. Sometimes though, if you're using non-metal materials and non-glass materials, Eevee can look quite good. But I find Eevee works best with more toon styles, such as this anime shader here. I'm going to change back to cycles. Here under device, you can choose to use your GPU if you'd like. This can allow for faster render, although unfortunately the GPU on my computer isn't compatible with Blender, which is why I use CPU. If you want to be able to enable 
your GPU for faster rendering in Blender, you can first left click edit and then choose preferences. Then if you left click system here, you can see at the top there's cycles renders devices, which is just pretty much choosing the graphics card you want to use. You can choose whichever option here works best with your graphics card. It can be helpful to read what it says here as you can notice here there's no compatible ones for my computer. Since there's so many types of graphics cards, I recommend doing a little bit of research into it yourself to find out the best option for your specific graphics card. For now, I'm going to change it back to none since I'll just use my processor or CPU. Once you've made any changes, you can also left click these three bars here and choose save preferences for good measure. When you're done with that, you can go ahead and just close the preferences menu. Here we have the sampling and sampling is essentially a number that determines the amount of calculations Blender performs to create our rendered result. It'll take in factors such as the materials, the lighting and the geometry of the object itself in order to calculate calculate how our image will look. So as you might imagine, more calculations or more samples will mean a better quality image, but more calculations also means a longer wait time for rendering. That's why finding a good balance is key. Here under viewport, this will determine what our image looks like when we use this button here called the viewport shading render preview, which allows us to preview what our rendered image will look like, but it's not the same as the final result. And for that reason, I will set it to a lower number. Here I've set it to something as low as 10, which will make a really grainy image, but because I'm recording here and I need a fast computer, 10 will suffice for me. The important settings we need to worry about here are these render ones. You can see here the default is 4096 samples, which is a lot of samples, especially if you're doing an animation. I wouldn't even use this amount for a single image. We also have this option called denoise, which is a great way to get rid of some of the grainy effects after the render is complete. I pretty much always have this enabled. There's also the noise threshold here, which will allow Blender to, to speed through rendering a lot easier, taking the noise of the image into consideration. For a faster render, increasing this number here will make render faster, but also it can look lower quality if you put it up too high. Now I've explained what some of these settings do, another setting here to be aware of are these light paths here. We're going to keep these at the default for this project, but these can have an effect on render time too especially if they're set really high. You can see you've got some presets here as well. For example, full global illumination looks really great, but it also takes a lot more time as it sets all these to a much higher number. Another way to speed up lighting is to change the clamping here. I like to change this direct light value here to five. Caustics are a feature you sometimes use with glass or transparent materials. They can considerably increase render times, but they do look pretty amazing when done well. So that's something to keep in mind for future projects. Under color management here, we can make tweaks to our render without having to change the lights or the materials. A look that I found worked well for this project was to change the look from none to medium high contrast. That will create a bit more contrast, which will help the subject of the image here stand out more. If you set this value too high to something like very high contrast, you can see the effect now looks a little bit too strong. The same applies if you make this a bit too low. Now the image looks a lot more flat and desaturated. I found medium high contrast was a good pick for this, but sometimes you might even want to go for high contrast, or you might want to leave it at default. I'm going to come back up to my render settings here, and before I change my samples, I'm going to first create some output settings. To do that, you come to this output properties here, and since this looks like a printer, you could remember it as the thing that comes out of the printer is the output, so it's the output settings. At the top here, we have our resolution of our image, I'm keeping it at 2K. Then we have our frame rate, which I have set to 30 frames per second, that means for every 30 frames, one second will pass. And then finally, we have our output here. Here, you can just press this folder button and choose a location on your computer to save all the frames. I recommend creating a brand new folder and then saving it there. So I'll left click this button. And now if I want to add a folder to save my frames in, I can just press this plus folder button and maybe I'll call this animation frames, but you can call it anything you like. Then I'll just double click it and then press accept. Now you can see that our output has been set to that folder. If you're only rendering a single image, you don't actually need to create an output folder. So first, I'm going to go over what I would typically do for rendering a single image. Since it's only one image, I can have a bit of a higher sample count than I would for an animation. And typically, I find a sample count of 200 is enough for me. But you could even go for something like 500 or even 1000 if you really want to. I'll also keep my noise threshold at 0 0.01. Then when you're ready, you can first press file and then choose save just in case Blender crashes. And then then you can press render and then choose render image to render the current frame. Another thing I'll do is change to the solid view. That way my computer won't be doing as much processing, which will make our render faster. Then you can go ahead and press render and then choose render image to render the current frame. Now you'll see a new window has come up and this is the blender render window. You can see my one's finished already 
but it will start calculating the samples and then when it's finished you won't see any more sample changes and it should look something like this such as a finished time. I set mine to a super low sample count just so I could quickly show this to you as yours will probably take a bit longer. Then once you're ready you can left click this image button and then choose save as and then you can choose a location on your computer to save it. For now I'm going to press this x button to close out of this menu. Now for final animation I'd probably want to make my max sample something like 100 or maybe even 50. As you saw there the sample I used for that single image was only five samples which shows you can still get away with a really low sample count. So take that into consideration as rendering loads of images can take a lot of time. For now I'll leave my max samples on 100 as that's what I used for this project animation and I'm going to change my noise threshold to 0.05. This will speed up my render as well. Also if you were wondering what this minimum samples was this would stop the noise threshold from stopping the samples at a certain point but for us we're not going to worry about that. Also make sure your time limit here is set to zero. If you have it set to anything higher your render will just stop after a certain point and that might be undesirable. Zero will make it so it takes as long as it needs to take. Once I've done that I'm going to make sure my timeline is all set up so I'm going to change from shader editor here to timeline and just as I'm wanting I've got my start frame at 1 and end frame at 250 so once you're happy with that you can go ahead and press render and choose render animation. Once you do that the render menu will pop up again and it will start rendering through each frame and all those frames will appear in this output folder that you set earlier. Here's roughly what it will look like when you have all your frames in one place when the animation is finished. You can see that all the frames are numbered and you can also view these as images by pressing this button here or you can view them as a list by pressing this button here. But something you may be wondering is why did we actually render these as frames and not just straight into a video. The reason for that is because if Blender crashes halfway through the render we could potentially lose the entire video file whereas if you render it as images and it crashes the previous rendered images won't just disappear and you can resume rendering the animation when you open Blender again. Of course though we're going to want to turn all our frames into a video so if you want to skip the next animation project and jump straight into turning your frames into a video you can check out episode 9 of this course on the top right hand corner. Keep in mind if you're watching this while this video airs, the episode won't be out for another 3 days. But in the meantime, you can watch this older video of mine where I pretty much teach the same thing. For now though, we're going to have a quick quiz to recap what we learned today. Number 1. How can we make our render pop more without tweaking the lighting or materials? Number 2. Why is it best to render our animations as images or frames rather than video? Number 3. What two settings did we change to improve our render time? Feel free to pause the video and take your time to answer the questions. Then when you're ready, you can press play and then I'll answer the questions for you. Number 1. How can we make our render pop more without tweaking the lighting or materials? To do this, we came to our render properties. Then if we scroll down to the bottom, there's this tab called color management. Here we could change the look of our image to increase the contrast. The good thing about contrast is it helps bring your viewer's attention to the image. So that's why it can be helpful to increase the contrast. Just make sure not to go overboard with this, otherwise it might look a bit weird. Number 2. Why is it best to render our animations as images rather than video? This is more of a just in case Blender crashes during rendering. If we do it as video, we might lose the entire video file, whereas if we do it as images, we can just resume rendering at the point in which Blender crashed and we won't lose any of our work. And then once we have our finished images we can just turn them into a video using Blender's sequencer which we will cover in episode 9 of this course. Number 3. What two settings did we change to improve render time? In our render properties settings here we changed under render as this will control how our image looks in the final render. We could first increase our noise threshold in order to speed up the render and also making sure we don't have a crazy high max samples will also help us have a faster render. This is important as the default for this is around 4096 which is a ridiculously high amount of calculations and you're going to be sitting there for a while especially if you're doing an animation. For my animation I went for a sample count of 100 and a noise threshold of 0.05 but you can do something even quicker if you would like. Great job on completing the quiz. If you're unsure if you got any of the questions right feel free to write them in the comment section below and I'll happily answer them for you. You can also let me know if you have any other questions about today's lesson and I'll do my best to answer it for you. In the next lesson we're going to be starting our second project in this course. This project will be a lot quicker since we've already covered most of the things that we'll need. And to start off we'll be making these hexagon shapes using the tissue built-in blender add-on again. Today we're beginning our second course project to make this cool abstract animation but first we need to make these hexagon pattern shapes to animate. Let's jump into it. I'm going to start off by first saving my project here that we've made in the last tutorials of the course and then I'm going to go ahead and press file again and then choose save as. The reason I saved it first is so the current file we're in is saved and then you can save as and we can save a new file with a new name. I'm just going to call mine animation course 2.blend but you can call it anything you like. Then I'll just choose save as. Now we have a second 
and copy of our file and we can go ahead and delete stuff without worrying about losing the permanently. I'm going to press this film camera button to come out of my camera view. Then I'm going to go ahead and delete some of these things I don't need. So I'm going to keep the camera as that's going to be pretty much animated the same. But I'm going to shift left click to select both of these and I'll shift left click to select this empty which controls our swirls here. And I'll just press X and choose delete to get rid of them. Then if you remember in the first episode of this course we created this donut base here. But just in case you're watching this for the first time we're going to create this from scratch. Again. So I'll just hide this for now and I'm going to press shift A then under mesh I'm going to choose torus. Then I'll press G and X to pull this out and if you remember we then press tab to go into edit mode and if we want to make this thicker we first need to select everything by pressing A for all and then we can press alt S and this will rather than scale the object it'll scale up the radius making this object thicker. I'll maybe go for something like this. Once you're happy with it you can press tab to come back into object mode and just like the other torus we're going to want to have a diamond pattern first before we turn it into a hexagon pattern. First though we're going to need to enable this add-on so I'm going to press edit and then I'm going to choose preferences. Then I'm going to left click add-ons here and in the search bar I'm going to search for tissue. Make sure you have this box checked and then you can left click these three bars and choose save preferences. Then you can go ahead and press X to close this preferences menu. In order to access our tissue settings, we can open the side menu by pressing N. We can also close it by pressing N too. Then we can left click this tissue tab here. And here we have our tissue settings. In the last tissue tutorial, we used the tessellate to put our component all over our torus. But today we're going to be using a function called dual mesh, which will create this hexagon pattern. Before we turn this into a diamond torus again, I'm going to show you what happens if we don't do this. So I'm just going to go ahead and press dual mesh. Then you can just press OK. And once it's been generated, I'll just press G and then Y to pull it out. You can see it creates this hexagon pattern, which might not look terrible, but it's not really the look I'm going for. So I'm going to press X and then delete. Dual mesh creates these hexagons by taking these square faces, known as quads, by triangulating the mesh, subdividing it, and then removing the edges in between. There's more info on this on the tissue wiki. So I'm going to want to turn my torus into a diamond. If you remember from episode one, what we done was we first left clicked our torus, then we went to our blue spanner or modifier properties, Press add modifier then under generate you can choose decimate or you can just search it in the search bar. I then changed it to unsubdivide and gave it an iteration of one. Now if we go into edit mode by pressing tab you can see it's still using these faces. Now our dual mesh will probably work with this anyway but just for cleanliness I'm going to go ahead and just press apply. And now these are editable in edit mode. I'm going to create a backup of this so I'll press shift D to duplicate and I'm going to press G and Y. I'm going to use this later. I'm going to left click this one here again and if I press dual mesh now and then press OK then press G and Z to pull it up. You can notice we have some issues here and that's to do with some of the faces not being planar. Planar just means the face is flat. The way I came to this conclusion was simply through experimentation since I was having this issue when I made this. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a fix. So I'll first left click my torus here, press tab to go into edit mode, A to select all and then I'm going to go to face and then choose triangulate faces. And now you can see it's added an edge which will make the faces all orientating in the same way. This is quite a confusing concept so don't worry if you're not understanding this is more something you can just try and remember if you're wanting to use a torus to create this hexagon power. Then I can go ahead and press dual mesh, press OK and now you can see we have the result we're looking for. I'm going to left click my dual mesh here and I'm going to press tab to go into edit. Then you can press 3 to go into face select mode and press A to select all. Now what I want to do is create some holes in these hexagons like I did in my final animation. So I'll first press I and that's going to allow me to create an inset inside the object. For you, you might not see this straight away and in order to enable this, you can just press I again and that will make it so it's insetting individual faces. Notice if I return it to the default, which yours might be, I can't do this. So I'll just press I again to enable it. Then once I've got a thickness I like, you can just left click and you can also make tweaks here using this menu here. It might be like this, in which case you can just left click to open it up and you can can also turn off the individual feature here. Then once I've done that I can just press X and I can choose faces to get rid of all these faces and now we've got something looking quite similar to what I have. But we still need to add some thickness and a few extra details to it. But first we're going to create the other two objects. Now I'm going to left click my spare here and I'm going to come to add modifier and under search I'm going to choose subdivision surface. If you want to save this as a backup for later you can duplicate it again but I'm not going to bother. And I'm going to press shift D again but this won't be a spare this will just be for my third object. To press G and Y to move it along and I'm going to change the levels viewport on this one to 2 and on the other one I've made I'm going to change the render to 1 
just so they match. Then just like the other one, we're, then we're just going to go ahead and apply these modifiers. So I'll just left click this drop down and choose apply. I'll do the same for the other one. Then just like the other one, to prevent the weird dual mesh issue, we're just going to press tab to go into edit mode, A to select all, come to face, triangulate faces, and now you can see those horizontal loops going around, which is what we want. And press tab to come back into object mode. Then in my tissue tab here, I'll left click dual mesh, press OK, and I'll press G and Y to move this one out. And you can see that's got those hexagon patterns we're looking for. Then I'm going to do the same for my last one here. Press tab to go into edit mode, A to select all, face, then triangulate faces. We got those horizontal lines that we need. Then when we come back into object mode by pressing tab, we can go ahead and dual mesh this one too and press OK. And I'll just press G and Y to pull this out over to here. Now we can go ahead and add holes to these ones as well. So I'll left click this one here. Press tab to go into edit mode, A to select all, free to go into face select mode, and then press I to inset. Once you've got a thickness you're happy with, you can just press X and then choose faces. And finally, we'll do this one here as well. Left click this one, tab to go back into edit mode, A to select all, free on the keyboard to go into face select mode, and then I to inset. If you can't get it to the right thickness, you can just left click and then you can change the thickness here. Remember this menu it might be hidden if it's down like this. If you want to change this thickness at a slower pace, you can hold down shift and then left click and you can see that that's now adjusting the thickness at a much slower pace. Once I'm happy, I'll just press X and choose faces. And now we've got our free base dual mesh. We just need to add some thickness to it. So I'm going to left click this one here, press add modifier and I'm going to choose solidify. So I'm going to change the thickness to 0 0.02 here and you can see as I increase that number that we get a little bit more thickness on our object. To make it easier to see, I'm just going to zoom in here. You can see the thickness that this is at. I found 0 0.02 was a good number for this one. We're going to do the same for the rest of these. So rather than going and adding them manually, we can left click these, these ones by shift left clicking them and then we can shift left click the one with the modifier on it and then we can left click this drop down here in the modifier properties and choose copy to select it. Now you can see we have some thickness on the other ones too. Another thing I added was a bevel modifier. So I'll come to here and I'm going to choose add modifier. I'm going to search for bevel. What bevel does, if I zoom in here, it'll almost slice off the edge turning it into two. And scale down the amount here. Here's what it will look like at zero. And then as I increase it, you can see it's cutting out these edges, creating a bit of a transition. You can even increase the segments if you want to make this a more smoother transition. But I like the quite hard transition, so I kept it at one. I'm then going to do the same thing again, where I'll select my other two, then shift select the last one. This time I'll come down to the bevel modifier, left click this drop down, and choose copy to select it. Then I'm going to make it a little bit less intense for these ones. So I'll maybe make this middle one here to 0 0.05 or 0 0.005. Yeah, that looks a lot better. And for the last one here, I'm going to make this one 0 0.0025. So just halving it each time. This is an artistic choice of course though, so it's something you can play around with until you find something you're happy with. Once I've done that, something I like to do is give it some smooth shading. So I'm going to right click and then I'm going to choose Shade Auto Smooth. Now you'll notice we still have those hard edges, but the other edges in the middle have disappeared as they've been smoothed out. If we were to right click and choose Shade Smooth, you'll notice that everything is smooth. So Shade All Smooth is a great way to make it so harder angle transitions still appear quite hard. If you're using an older version of Blender, when you right click, you won't get the shade all smooth function. So what you can do in that case is you can press right click shade smooth and instead you can come to this green triangle and turn on auto smooth here. I'm going to do the same for the rest of these. So I'll just left click this one, right click, shade auto smooth and for this last one here, right click and shade all smooth. Awesome. Now we have our abstract shapes ready for animation in the next episode. For now though, we're going to have a quick quiz to recap what we learned today. Number one, what built-in add-on did we use to quickly generate these hexagon patterns? Number two, what button on the add-on did we use to create the hexagon pattern? Number three, how did we fix this issue which wouldn't give us perfect hexagons? Feel free to take your time to answer the questions by pausing the video and when you're ready, you can press play and I'll answer the questions for you. Number one, what built-in add-on allows us to quickly generate these hexagon parts. Just like in the first lesson in this course, we use the tissue add-on. This is built into Blender, meaning all we have to do is press edit, then preferences, and then we went to add-ons, searched for tissue, and enabled it. Number two, what button on this add-on did we use to create the hexagon path? If I come to my tissue tools here, we press the dual mesh button in order to generate this hexagon pattern. Number three, how did we fix the issue with not getting proper hexagons? If you remember, if I was to select this torus here, which hasn't had the fix on it, and press dual mesh and press OK and press G and Z to pull this up. You can see we've got a mixture of different types of polygons here. Since we wanted just hexagons, we had to fix the mesh a little bit. So I'll just press X and then delete, and then left click this, press tab to go into edit mode, and then you can just press A to select all your faces. We then came up to this face button here 
and we just triangulate the faces. Then sometimes you'll get it so the edges aren't aligned horizontally, in which case you can press 2 to go into edge like mode and then you can left click an edge, come to edge here and you can choose rotate edge and we'll just repeat this process for all these edges until they're all facing horizontally. Unfortunately this happens for torses of a certain thickness. You can also left click and then shift left click multiple of these edges and that way you can press edge and then rotate edge to rotate them all at once. Then once you've got all your edges rotated like this so they're not horizontal, you can press tab to come back to object mode and then choose dual mesh and press OK. Then when you press GZ to pull this up, you can see we've got perfect hexagons just like we wanted. Great job on completing today's lesson and quiz. In the next lesson, we'll be moving on to actually animating the three dual mesh torses we made today. And then after that, we're going to turn all of our frames into an animation. Last time, we made this hexagon pattern shape, so today we're going to combine all the skills we learned so far in this course to animate and render these shapes. So first thing some of you will notice is we need to get rid of some of these extra objects that we made in the last episode. So what I'll do is I'll left click this object here and then I'm just going to start shift left clicking all of these objects. Then once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and press M and this will bring up the move to collection button. Then I can choose plus new collection and I'm just going to call this spares and you can just press OK. Now in the top right hand corner, you you can see we now have a collection called spares and to remove this from the render we simply just check this button and now everything has disappeared. Then we're going to go ahead and scale down more of our objects. So I'll just select this one here and I'm going to press S and that will allow us to scale this down. Then I'll press G and Y to pull it a little bit more towards our camera. Then I'll left click this film camera button here so I can see our camera view. Press G and Z and pull it down. Now you can see it roughly in our camera. I'll maybe move it a little bit further from our camera to maybe around here. And I'll press the film camera again to see how it's looking. And I'll press R and Y so I can rotate on the Y axis. And I'm just going to press R and Z and I'm going to get it into the same kind of position I had my other one. Great, now we have our first shape in place. Now we can go ahead and copy the transforms of the other ones to get them roughly in the same position to move them easier. So to do that, I'm going to left click the film camera button again to come out of camera view and I'm going to keep this object selected here. I'm going to shift left click these two and I'm going to shift left click the first one again. Notice how it will now be highlighted yellow, meaning this is now the active selected object. Then if I press N, we can get this side menu. And if you come up to item, although by default it's usually visible in all menus, you can see we have all these transforms. This is pretty much what the scale of our object is. So in order to copy these, I'm going to go ahead and right click this rotation and you can see if I left click copy single to select it, you can see that the rotation which I copied, which was the Y axis, has now been copied for this object here. But of course, we want to do this for all rotations. So I'll right click and this time I'm going to choose copy all to select. Now you can see it's rotated the same way as my object down here. Then we need to do the same for scale. So I'll just right click scale and then I'm going to choose copy all to select it. Now we have the same scale. And finally, we can do the same for location. So I'll right click this and I'll choose copy all to select it. Now if we go back into the camera view, you can see all of our meshes are overlapping each other. This is a great and quick way to quickly scale things down at the same time. This can be great as well if you decide to add something extra later. I'm then going to left click my dual mesh.002 here in the menu and press G and Y just to pull it out. I'm going to keep this one roughly in the middle. And I'm going to do the same for the dot zero zero three. Left click it and press G and Y to pull it out. I'm also going to come back to frame one on my timeline. Now I'm not quite happy with the rotation of all these objects and I want to rotate them all at the same time. So what I can do is I can shift left click all of these and then up here at the top you can see there's this transform pivot point option here. By default it's set to medium point. This means when I press R it'll rotate in the middle of all of these masses but we want to make it so all of them rotate on their own since they're all individual objects. So to do that I would just change it from medium point to individual origins. Now when I press R you can see they all rotate individually. I'll maybe press R and Z to rotate them on the Z axis a little bit. Maybe around there is nice. And now when we play our animation, it should look something like this. Now if you remember, at roughly halfway through the animation here, the camera will line up in the center. So this is the point where I want to make sure everything in our scene is centered. I'll switch to this frame on the timeline, which is around 125, and I'm going to press my film camera button again. And here I might just press G and Y to move things along a little bit. And I might even press G and X to pull them back. And I can maybe even scale them down with S or scale them up a little bit. For now, our animation should look something like this. If you want, you can also scale down these to match my final one, but I'm going to leave mine as they are. When we were covering animation in the earlier tutorial in this series, we learned that sometimes you can have issues with animating on the local axis, but this time we're actually going to be using this to our advantage, as I quite like the look it creates. What I mean by this is we're going to be pressing R and then Z twice in order to rotate across the Z axis, but it's actually going to create a strange rotating all around effect when we do this. Of course, if you want to learn how to rotate without this effect, please feel free to let me know and I'll create a separate tutorial on how 
to fix this, but we're going to be using this to our advantage in this tutorial. To start off, I'll left click my first hexagon ring here, and I'm going to press I and then choose rotation. This will add a keyframe, which will save the rotation at this point on the timeline. Then I'm going to come all the way over to frame 250, which is the end of my animation, and I'm going to press R, Z, and then Z again, and then I'm going to choose 180 to rotate it on the positive 180 degrees on the Z axis. Then I can press enter, I, and choose rotation. Now when we play, you can see it creates this rotating effect. So we've got our animation, but you can see this is a little bit stronger than what I went for in my final animation. So in this case, we would go ahead and try an experiment with a different rotation. So I'm going to come back to my end frame, and this time I'm going to left click this keyframe here, and press X and choose delete. Then we can press R, and then Z twice, and this time we'll just put in 90, which is half of 180. Then we can just press I and choose rotation. Now we've got something which is a lot more subtle. Now we've rotated this one, we'll go ahead and rotate the other ones. For the one at the very end, it actually has the same rotation as the first one, so we can go ahead and copy these. However, do keep in mind, if you've keyframed more than just the rotation, you might have some issues here. So make sure to either keyframe only the rotation, or if you're struggling to understand this concept, you can just animate this one like you animated the other one from scratch. For us though, I'll left click this one here, and I'm going to shift left click our one with the animation on it, which is now highlighted yellow, showing that this is the active selection, and we can press Control L for link, and then we can choose link animation data. Now when I press play, you can see both of them are rotating at the same time. Finally, we can do the middle one, and we're actually going to do this a slightly different Different rotation. So first I'm going to come to frame 1 and press I and choose rotation and that will save the rotation at this point. Then I'll come to 250 and I'm going to choose R then Z twice to rotate on the local Z axis and I'm going to choose minus 90. Then I'll choose I and then choose rotation and now we should have these going in the opposite way. Excellent. Now we've done that we want to make this more of a smooth movement because you can see how it's doing that slow at the start and slow at the end and fastest in the middle. If you remember from the animation tutorial in this course that was the Bezier type of interpolation. So we're going to want to change these to linear. I also temporarily disabled the camera constraint, so sorry about that if any of you were confused. But if you do want to disable it in your own animation, you can just go ahead and left click this I button here, and I'll turn it off, or you can just press X to remove it permanently. I'm going to keep it on for now though. Also, if you followed along in the first animation tutorial, you will remember how we animated this camera, and you can go ahead and change the rotation of this one if you like. Right now, it rotates a grand total of around 20 degrees on the Z axis, but you can make this more subtle if you like. I'm going to leave it for now though. I'm going to come back to frame 1 and make some more edits. So first I'll left click my first shape here and I'm going to press A to select all my keyframes in the timeline. Right click and then in interpolation mode we can change it from this smoother bezier movement to this more straight linear movement. Notice now if I press play that the rings on the start and the end are moving at a constant pace whereas the one in the middle is moving more slowly and gradually and speeding up in the middle. I'll then do the same for the middle one too by left clicking it Press an A to select all keyframes, right click, interpolation mode, and choose linear. Now everything should be working properly. Next up, we're going to want to add our materials that we had earlier. So we put bronze in the middle here, and if I come down to my materials here, and left click this button here, we can actually choose the material we have. Right now, we only have our studio background, and if you use the shield button, your material won't have disappeared, but otherwise, it will have disappeared when we deleted the swirls. So we need to go ahead and import the materials again. If you do have it in here, you can go ahead and switch to it. Of course though, since we're going to be working with materials, I'm going to change this third ball here. First of all, I'm going to choose File, and then I'm going to come to Append. Append is like the import, but for Blender files. I'll then go ahead and I'll double click my animation course .blend, which if you remember, is what we saved our last project as. Then I'll open up Material, and here you can see those are silver and bronze materials. So I'll left click the bronze, and then Control left click the silver, just like that one as well. Then we can just left click this Append, and I'll import these materials into Blender. Then we can left click our middle one here, and in our red and black checkered ball, the material properties, I can click this drop down, and choose bronze. Then I'm going to set these ones here to silver and I'll do the same for the first one as well. Drop down and silver. And now we have our materials set up from episode 5 of this course. Now I'm going to go ahead and save my file first by pressing Control S just in case Blender crashes and I'm going to change to my render viewport shading mode. Awesome, it's looking pretty good so far but you can see in my final animation mine was a little bit brighter and one of the ways I achieved this is I actually added a third light for this animation. So I'm going to come back to my solid mode. For you, you can stay in this mode if you like but I'm going into solid mode just because I'm recording at the same time and it's faster on my computer. Then I'm going to left click this film camera button, zoom out, and I'm going to left click this light here because I'm just going to go ahead and duplicate it by then pressing shift D. And now I don't want to move it in the wrong way. So I'm going to right click to cancel any movements and I'm going to press G and then I'm going to press shift Z. This will make it so it will grab, G for grab, and then move this object, but only on the Y and X axis, excluding the Z axis. Remember that Z axis is the up and down. And I'll maybe move it to around here. I'll rotate around to see how it's looking. And maybe I'll pull it back by pressing G and X, like this. Then I'm going to come into my render view to see how that's looking. Hmm, 
This is maybe a little too bright for my liking, so I might tweak around with this a little bit more. I moved it to around the middle here, and I feel like that looks pretty decent. But if you don't like it, you can go ahead and press X and delete it before rendering. Do keep in mind though, this is technically impossible in a way since we don't actually have a light coming here. So in certain scenes, this may not look too realistic, but for our purposes, I think this looks okay. We can also come up to my render properties here, and if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, we have our color management here, and we already have it set to medium high contrast, but we can experiment with the different modes to see what we think. And yeah, it looks like medium high contrast is going to be the best. I might also, with this light still selected, come to my green light bulb and maybe change the power down to something like 100. I also think this light might be a little bit too close as well, so I'm just going to press G and X to pull it right to the back, and I might even pull the backdrop back a little bit as well by left clicking it and pressing G and X and I'll press the film camera to come back to here. In the end because I'm a bit of a perfectionist I ended up moving this light to the right here and that's that it just involves a lot of experimentation until you find something you're satisfied with. Now I'm going to set up my output and render properties so we're ready to render our frames. So first I'm going to come to my output properties and here I'm going to keep my frame rate on 30 frames per second and our resolution the same as our other animation and here it says we've got our output set. We want to maybe give this something else because if you remember when we start to render our animation, it will save them as numbers, and because these numbers are the same as our other frames, they will just overwrite each other, which wouldn't be good. So we're going to create a brand new folder. So I'll first left click this folder button, and in my folder here, I'm then just going to press the plus button, and I'll call this one hexagon animation frames. I'll then double click it and choose accept. I'll leave it at PNG, keep my frame range as is, and now we can come to our render settings. As we discussed in the rendering tutorial, we want to make sure we don't have these settings too high for an animation, and we can maybe even get away with a lower sample count here. I recommend maybe making it even lower if your computer is struggling with this animation, but for me, I'm going to keep this at max samples at 100, and my noise threshold at 0.05. Make sure your denoise is on, and remember, all these settings are in under render, not viewport. Viewport determines how things will look inside of here. Also, if you have a GPU, this would be the time to change the GPU compute. I'm going to keep mine on CPU. I'm also in cycles. Also, you can set your clamping direct light to 5 to speed things up a little bit. And now we should be ready to render. If you like, you can do a test render by pressing render and then render image first. If you want to get a rough idea how it's looking, or alternatively, you can just start rendering the animation and check the frames as you go to see if you're happy with them. And then once you're kind of happy, you can just let it do its thing in the background. But I'm just going to go ahead and press render and then render animation and your frames will go ahead and start rendering. Once your animation is finished, you should have all your frames in here and it will look something like this. Great job on completing today's lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to be finishing off this tutorial by turning all of our frames into an animation, which we can view as a video mp for file. There won't be a quiz for this lesson as it's mostly concepts we've covered already and more this is just like a practice lesson to put everything we've learned into practice. But great job for making it through the course this far. Only one lesson left and then we're finished. There we have our animation as images or frames. We need to turn our frames into video. First, I've opened up a brand new Blender file. Then I'm going to drag out the side here and I'm going to come to my render settings. We can leave all these settings as default since a lot of these won't affect our sequencing, which is turning the rendered frames into a video. Then in output, my resolution, I'm just going to keep at the same width and height as my rendered frames. So for me, that was 1920 by 1080. But for example, if you were rendering a horizontal phone style animation, this might be 1080 by 1920 for you. Then frame rate, we had it set to 30 frames per second, which means for every 30 images, one second will pass in our video. I'll keep my frame star and end at 250, but then remember, we actually rendered two animations. So in this case, we'll actually need to change it from 250 to 500 if you want to keep it as one long animation. Otherwise, you can keep it at 250 and render these one at a time. Then for the output, this will decide where our video will be saved. So I'm going to left click this button here to open a, a folder. And I'm just going to press this plus button to create a new folder in the location I want. And I'm just going to call this animation video. I'll then double click it and then press accept. Then we still got it set on PNG and that's just going to create a bunch of new PNGs, which is kind of useless for us since we already have them. So we're going to change this from PNG to FFmpeg video. I'll keep it on RGB and I'm going to come down to encoding. Here it's on Matroska by default, but we want to change this to MPEG4, which is pretty much MP4. For quality, I'm going to change it from medium quality to high quality. Encoding speed, we can leave at the default and video codec. I like to keep this at H.264, which is also the default. Audio settings, we can leave alone since we have no audio in our animation, but you can always add some music on top of it or something like that using some free video editing software such as DaVinci Resolve which is what I use to edit my videos. Now all that's set up we can go ahead and import our frames. So first we're going to change from 3D viewport here 
to video sequencer. This is pretty much like a mini video editor inside a blender. Then if I press this add here, we can choose image sequence and that allows us to add a bunch of images into our blender file, which can then be rendered with the sequencer. So I'll choose image sequence. I'm going to find my frames, which are in here. Keep in mind, mine are in a different location from yours since I rendered my animation before I even taught the course. I'll double click this and I'm going to left click the top frame here, scroll down all the way to the bottom and shift left click the bottom one. You can just press A to select all, but I find that this is less likely to cause any bugs. Then I'll set my end frame here to 250, since these are 250 frames, and I can just use add image strip. Now you can see we have our image strip inside of our sequencer. I'm also going to change from shader editor here to timeline, and I'm going to move all the way up to frame 250, and I'll just go one frame from 250, since technically we're going to be adding from frame 251. Then I'll press add again, and I'm going to choose image sequence, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to choose my hexagon frames, which are just in here. And I'm going to choose my end frame as 500 this time. Then I can left click my first frame here and shift left click our last one. Perfect. Then I can press add image strip. Now you can see we've got these back to back. Now since we've got everything else set up, we can press control S to save just in case things crash and you can save that somewhere on your computer. Then I'll go ahead and press render animation by left clicking render then render animation. You can see how it goes through frames much quicker because it's not actually having to calculate what these frames look like. Rather, it's just taking these images and then turning them into a video, which is much faster. Great, now it's finished. You can see there's no more rendering going on here and we can go ahead and open up the video file to see how things are looking. Now you can see I've opened up the video file here and we've got a working animation. Now there's an mp4 file. And yeah, with that, I'd like to thank you so much for following along with this course. Or even if you're just stopping by for the single tutorial, I still appreciate it, so thank you. We also got our first Patreon during this course, so a big thank you to Kyle for becoming our first Patreon. With that though, I'd like to thank you again for tuning into the course and I look forward to seeing you for future courses and tutorials. Also, if you enjoy my teaching style, I also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, complete with personalized lessons and post-lesson quiz questions and support. Link in the description if you're interested. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. You can also support the channel by making a one-time donation through Super, but even just liking, subscribing and sharing if you enjoyed is more than enough to support the channel. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.